Manana Sudulis, everyone. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being here. Just um, um, my name is Kathy Rivera Castro and I'll be moderating and hosting uh, today's virtual gathering. Joining me as my co-host and my technical support is Dr. Milai Young, um, who will be assisting me. Milai would like to uh, share some housekeeping roles at the moment. Okay. Um, good, day and good morning, everyone. I am Mila Young, and I just want to check everyone that you are seeing our PowerPoint presentation, our screen that says Guam Diabetes Control Coalition Diabetes Alert Day, March 23rd. Yes. Yes, okay. it's very clear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so like what Kathy mentioned, um, uh, we just want to remind everyone about our housekeeping for today's presentation and um, we highly encourage you to keep your video on and if you could kindly also mute your mic or speaker when you're not talking you could also do this by um, holding down the space bar to temporarily um, mute or unmute yourself and if we can kindly ask everyone to um, open your chat pane and type in your name an email address um, for today's attendance. And um, we will use that information in case you post any question also on the same um, chat box. And also to let everybody know that we will be recording this session uh, shortly. Thank you, Milai. Once again, Manana Sidulis, everyone. Buenas and half a day. Thank you for joining us for the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition on this virtual gathering to alert and give a wake up call to our community on the issues and risk of diabetes on our island as we commemorate the American Diabetes Association's Diabetes Alert Day. As we begin, um, I would like to welcome Dr. Keith Horinucci who is the chairperson of the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition to give his opening remark. Good morning and uh, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> yes, I would like to welcome everybody that's here. I see a quite a large number and uh, excited to see that people have an interest in this topic of diabetes here on Guam. Uh, as the chairperson for the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition, uh, welcome to our special day or a special hour in which we want to highlight uh, some of the issues about diabetes as this has been a, a challenge for us here in Guam uh, throughout Micronesia in dealing with the, the risks of uh, diabetes and the complications that occur from diabetes. Uh, the Diabetes Coalition is a collaboration of private and public uh, sector individuals and stakeholders. So I wanna thank those who have been with the coalition uh, for years. Uh, it's basically voluntary but we have a lot of dedicated people to work towards this uh, challenge that we have here in Guam. And so today highlights uh, a special day, the Diabetes Alert Day, in which we can share some information and keep our motivation moving forward so that we can uh, someday uh, conquer this, uh, this health problem. Uh, that we can improve our lifestyle habits so that we have better control of diabetes. So once again, thank you uh, for all the people who are participating and I look forward to a, a great presentation that we have here in the next hour. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Key. And now please join me in welcoming our Megahaga, the Honorable Luli Angaro, 
Um, we are very privileged and honored that she's able to join us today. Welcome, Governor. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, say a few remarks. I'm so happy to see that Dr. Horonucci is still out there, very active in uh, community outreach and educating our people. I I've worked with him before with the uh, tobacco issues in Guam and with the Peace Council. And I know that chairing this very important uh, coalition, Dr. Haranucci, in your capacity, we're going in the right direction and we'll do some good things for preventing diabetes and changing lifestyle. Um, I'm sure all of us here knows a person with diabetes. Um, that's how prevalent it is in Guam. And as I understand it, data shows that nearly 12% of all adults in Guam have diabetes. And this is very alarming. And when you break it down to ethnic groups, 16.2% of those are uh, Chamorro de descent. And I, and I think that's an alarming number also. Of course, we all know diabetes is a very common disease and one that most people know about, but perhaps not everyone knows how difficult it can be to manage and just how much it affects the quality of life on our island. Diabetes, as we all know, cause major problems like being blind, kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, lower limb amputation and other ailments. And the tragedy about all this is as we all know, diabetes can be prevented. A healthy diet, physical activity, avoiding tobacco, these actions can delay or even prevent type two diabetes. As a nurse, I know too well what diabetes can do to a person and the toll it can take on a family if treatment is prolonged. That is why I strongly believe that the work of the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition is so important. You are out there in the community teaching people healthy habits and encouraging them to seek medical care when they need it. But I also know that more resources need to be invested in, the, in this cause to promote regular health screenings so we can catch this terrible disease early and help people manage it. My administration is completely committed to increasing the data and research devoted to disease to diabetes prevention, which are necessary to understand diabetes prevalence on the island. Thank you again, Dr. Hoanichi, for your leadership in this Diabetes Coalition. And thank you to all the members, like you said, who have volunteered and have worked very passionately uh, through this coalition and through other community awareness uh, events, because that's the only way we can really beat this disease, is the more we're aware of it, the more we teach our people, the more we start early, early in life, even in prenatal, is where the work begins. And also that just shows how much work we need to do ahead of us. But a committed group like this organization and the cooperation of our community is going to make us successful. So thank you again. Thank you, Kathy, and everyone uh, who has put this uh, virtual meeting alert day. Um, to do more awareness to our pe for our people. Sizu Smasi. Sizu Smasi, Governor. Thank you for your commitment in helping us move forward our mission uh, to be able to create a healthier island community. It's uh, the support of our policymakers and our in your administration that would help us be able to address these issues that befall in our our community. So we are very grateful. And now I'd like to um, welcome our Zigundu Namagalahi, the Honorable Josh Norio, to give us a few remarks. Half a day, hey. Lieutenant Governor. Half a day, Kathy, and half a day, Governor, and everybody. Um, you know, just kind of um, maybe using this time to maybe uh, extend um, or expand on the Governor's efforts 
since we came into administration, uh, she's always been telling me that the center of healthcare on Guam is really at public health. Uh, and I'm reminded that uh, one of the last things that uh, we did prior to the pandemic was uh, come together for the annual um, non-communicable disease conference that Pat Luces does so well organizing. Uh, but I think what you'll see um, uh, uh, while we get through this pandemic is uh, other areas that we intend to uh, expand um, access to uh, better food choices. And so this emphasis that the governor has spent uh, harnessing both the agriculture and aquaculture industries is meant to address food security, but it's also meant to reintroduce uh, a higher frequency of our people to uh, nourish themselves with local food. Um, and that's, of course, one way to try and bring down diabetes. The other thing that um, we're looking at uh, focusing on children's nutrition with the Guam Department of Education and, um, and aligning a, and establishing a school uh, healthcare initiative where we intend to uh, work together closely with the Guam Department of Education and their school health counselors and the work trying to identify uh, families that are high risk, families that are um, under utilizing healthcare or don't have access to healthcare and try and bring them in through the community health centers and hopefully um, to benefit from a bunch of the programming that public health is developing uh, in partnership uh, with this organization and with the coalition of nonprofits, individuals and businesses that are committed to reducing diabetes on Guam. So I just wanna congratulate all of you in your efforts and um, and look forward to working with you very closely in the future. This is Maasi, Lieutenant Governor. That's very exciting to know that um, we have uh, some plans in the future of how we are able to move forward. So thank you for that. Uh, Speaker Terlahi is unable to join us this morning, but did send a message um, that I'd like to read on her behalf. Uh, it's dated March 23rd, 2021. I would like to thank the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition for inviting me to give remarks this morning and I apologize that I cannot be there in person as the 36th Guam Legislature is in session today. As the Legislature's Oversight Chair on Health, it is, a great, it is with great interest that I accept this opportunity to say a few words about the havoc diabetes has wrecked upon our island. I'm grateful to be a part of this wake-up call to our community and to help expand outreach efforts and call to action to finally get diabetes under control on Guam. Back in 2018, Dr. Edna Acuna from GRMC was quoted stating, the rate of diabetes care is of epidemic proportions and that one out of every five people here has diabetes. In 2020, we came to learn that those with diabetes were at high risk for COVID-19. I read the write-up today for today's events, and it started with the Dr. Ann Pabitsky, Guam Territorial Epidemiologist with the Department of Public Health and Social Services, will be presenting some alarming statistics on diabetes and COVID applicable to Guam. I greatly appreciate Dr. Pabitsky's efforts. This data is extremely important, and we now have a better understanding of who on our island is most at risk for COVID, and I look forward to reviewing the presentation. These numbers, while alarming, should not be new to us. We have been hearing that Guam's rate of diabetes is at epidemic proportions for many years now. And as far back as 2010, the Pacific Islands Health Officers Association has declared a regional state of health emergency due to the epidemic of non-communicable diseases, NCDs in the United States, affiliated Pacific Islands US API, which included American Samoa, Guam, the Republic of Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Palau, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. This declaration of emergency didn't come with drastic changes to our medical infrastructure. It didn't come with billions in federal aid and increasing numbers of families in Guam are all dependent on life-saving dialysis. The Guam Diabetes Con Control Coalition has been consistent and diligent in doing outreach on what many often call the silent killer. While little can be done to prevent type one diabetes, to alter our genetics or exposure to harmful chemicals brought to our island without our knowledge, we can control our lifestyles today and affect other causes of diabetes. 
I understand the difficulty of changing how we think about food when our lifestyles and culture encourage showing love by sharing meals. But I am extremely encouraged by the increasing number of joggers and runners I see on the road, the increasing health food selections in the grocery stores, and the number of new establishments dedicated to exercise or new, pr new prep options. Kudos and Sizuas Maasi to the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition, the Department of Public Health and Social Services for its continued work to keep us educated and empowering us with tools to combat this disease on Guam and save lives. And now I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Art St. Augustine, the Director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services to give us a few remarks. Director Art. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Dr. Horonichi, it's good to see you. It's been a while since we worked on the project. Dr. Horonichi and I have some history in working with our seniors in terms of a program for health promotion many, many years ago. But today, first and foremost, let me thank you for the invitation to speak and just provide some brief remarks. And so with that, I wanna thank the coalition for the work you have done, the work you're doing today and the work you will continue to do on behalf of our family and friends who are struggling with this disease. With regards to that, I also wanna thank all the partners who have continued and who have volunteers who have continued to contribute to the work of the coalition. On behalf of the department with Mr. Patrick Luces and other public health team members who work on the coalition and partner with you, you have our commitment to continue the work that we do to advance our efforts to address diabetes as a disease that as a governor stated is preventable. So I'm not really gonna go into all the data and all the, the information the governor has already touched, but I do wanna share with you that as we look at our social and health indicators out there, one of the things we have is more dialysis centers coming up and more and more is showing up. And to me, that is really the challenge that is a testament to us to continue to be vigilant and, and, and really work even harder to close those dialysis centers, to not give them the business and it is definitely a hard task. It's not an easy task. It's a task that we have as a community and as a family of Guam and Micronesia have been working with and through for many years. And it'll take years for us to make these lifestyle changes. We all heard the messaging, keep, keep a balanced weight, eat a healthy diet, be physical, don't be sedentary. Those messaging and getting tested, all that needs to continue. And we just got to do our very best. I will share with you as the governor talked that, you know, we pretty much all know someone with diabetes, if not ourselves, a family, a friend. I will share with you all this morning that both my parents were diabetics and both my parents passed away with complications of diabetes. We had a different interest and in, an interesting situation with my parents. My dad was at home dialysis, peritoneal. Uh, they didn't go to the dialysis centers. Mom was insulin dependent, but nonetheless, mom experienced blindness. Dad experienced blindness. And so it really called on our family to pull together. And so let's, it's a wake up call. We do need to pull together as much as we are working on prevention and education. For those who are dealing with it, the family, I ask to please help those that are dealing with it because it calls for a family approach. It called for us to hire caregivers to help um, take care of mom and dad and really learning a lot of information about what we can do to help. And so, you know, dad, has a passion for Winchell's Donuts, and I would take him for his appointments, but I was not his favorite son every time I took him, simply because I wouldn't go to Winchell's to get him donuts. But at the end of the day, I would come home and he has a box of donuts. And I said, like, Dad, how did you get the donuts? How did you get all that sugar? He goes, hey, that's none of your business. You know, I do have nephews I can call upon other than you, and you, my son, don't want to get me donuts. And I tried to explain how much, because I care for him, we want him to be around for as long as possible, but unfortunately, you know, he did succumb to the disease. But having said that though, it is a lifestyle change and um, it's really about quality of life. So to Dr. Horonuchi and all the coalition members today and all those in the past, thank you for your work. Thank you for the work that you will be doing in the future with our team here at Public Health. And I really wanna thank you for the time to just give a brief message and wanted to just give it on a personal angle as a as the Director of Public Health and Social Services, I too have experienced the impact, the effect, and the loss of some people in my own family who have struggled and have succumbed to diabetes. So thank you all, and thank you for the great work you do, Dr. Hornichi, and to the team at Sizuas Mouse. 
And so this Mahasi director art, yes, it is a difficult and daunting task, but together as one, we're able to do that. It's often said, and I know the governor has also said it, that the people of Guam are resilient and um, hard work and difficult tasks, I think is not um, a challenge to many of us or to our people here because we all collaborate and work together. Now I would like to um, introduce Dr. Ann Pobitsky, the Territorial Epidemiolo Epidemiologist of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Ann Pobitsky came to Guam back in November 2018 after 22 years away to assume the role of the Territorial Epidemiologist for Guam. Ann lived on Guam from 1979 to 1996 and worked as a planner one, two, and three in the government of Guam, and as well as the health and social researcher at the University of Guam in the VA NIN CDS Research Center for the United States Naval Hospital. She worked as the epidemiologist at the Oregon Health and Science University from 1998 to 2002, and the Hawaii State Department of Health from 2003 to 2014. She was a researcher at the University of Hawaii at Manoa from 2002 to 2003, and once again from 2014 to 2016. Her research background includes chronic disease epidemiology, social epidemiology, community health needs assessments, and addressing health disparities. Her current work focuses on infectious disease epidemiology on Guam, including addressing COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Ann Pobitsky. Uh, yes, um, I'll be able to share my screen, correct? Yes, you can. Okay, but first, before um, we start, we want to make sure everybody knows the difference between type one and type two diabetes. Here, we are, the data we're presenting is mainly, it's, this is type two diabetes. Type one diabetes used to be called juvenile onset diabetes or um, insulin dependent diabetes, whereby uh, it's mostly occurs in younger people. That's why it was called juvenile onset. But um, type two diabetes is called insulin resistance. And this is where uh, the body produces insulin, but the cells don't respond to it in the way they should. So it's called insulin resistance. And I believe Dr. Cabrera's on board here as a participant. He can explain this a little more later. Type two diabetes mainly occurs in people who get older and they get overweight. That's the big risk factors for that. So we're not really talking about type one diabetes here. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you see it? Are we good? Yes, we're good. Okay. I um, believe this is the second slide, but that's all right. Um, basically, the estimates we get for the prevalence of diabetes, type 2 diabetes in our population, come from the BRFSS. And the governor already quoted some statistics. Yes, that we're at about 12%. And the U.S. is at about 11%. However, our age-adjusted prevalence is estimated to be 13.3%, or approximately 22,400 people. Age adjustment is done to compare. It's a little fairer comparison because it accounts for um, the age differences in um, a phenomenon or disease. And so if you take these two estimates, the crude estimate and the age-adjusted estimate, we have an approximately 20,000 people on Guam with diabetes in 2019. Um, diabetes prevalence increases with age. Uh, there is an estimated 20% of the population uh, in the 55 to 64 range and 22% for those over age 65. Diabetes generally tends to be higher among those with lower education and lower household income. And people with diabetes are also likely to have cardiovascular disease comorbidities because diabetes interferes with the circulatory system. And this is a map of the last 10 years, I'm sorry, a chart of the age adjusted and the crude prevalence um, of estimates for diabetes in our population. And as you can see, it fluctuates year to year. And I, somebody recently said, oh good, look, in 2019 it went down. Yeah, it did, but numbers fluctuate year to year, these estimates, but the linear trend is uh, for an increase. I really would like to go back and get data from the 2000s and the 90s. But one of the ways we do have to look at that 
is looking at data. We were able to go back to 1955 for um, the causes of death. And when we look at the proportion of deaths due to diabetes, that's on a definite uh, increase. This is 60 years of data from our uh, annual vital statistics reports. And as you can see, the diabetes as a proportion of deaths is going up. So as you know, um, I'm supposed to be presenting some alarming statistics but we've been actually reporting these alarming statistics for several months now. We noticed um, back in the fall during the surge when we started to see a lot of deaths um, and we were able to analyze the data, this is when we really saw that diabetes, a lot of people with diabetes were dying of COVID. And so this analysis presenting here, this is just a short analysis. We have um, looked at everything from March 12th to the end of February. Uh, during that time period, there were 7,739 7, 7, cases and 133 deaths for which we have complete information. I do not have the death certificate um, for one. And I also have not included uh, anything from March. So the vast majority of COVID cases were among those under age 45. The opposite is true of COVID-related deaths where 88% of the cases were among those older than 45 years. And three-fourths of the COVID-related deaths were among those aged 55 uh, years and above. I only say that to point out that diabetes is more common at, as we age. So this is basically the analysis, the alarming statistics that we've seen for months. What's interesting about this is not that I've updated it with the latest numbers, but that we've seen a consistent pattern over the past six months in diabetes death. The proportion of people who have died, who have a diag also have a diagnosis of diabetes is continuing to be approximately half. Sometimes it's 48%, sometimes it's 52, but it's been a consistent pattern for the past six months. So we know that people with diabetes are definitely at risk. And this is kind of the methodology of how I'm, how I'm counting this. And as you can see, um, Listed on the death certificate, we have 42 or 31.6% of the deaths. That's not all of it. We have um, 33 where we have both the line listing or MD notes and the death certificate. They all agree. An additional nine where it was on the death certificate, but we did not have it in the notes. So that's kind of interesting. Not everybody gets complete information. Sometimes the hospital isn't getting what we have at public health and so on. And the medical examiner or the person who's the hospital pathologist doesn't have complete information. We do have uh, line listing data uh, and MD notes on 33. And we have agreement on 33 where we have both line listing and the death certificate. And when you add this up, and the 42 um, with the MD notes and the death certificate combined where we agree, plus nine that we didn't know about on the death certificate and 33, that's 75. So it's about half. In contrast, only about 9% of the cases during the same time period had a diagnosis of diabetes, which is very similar to what uh, we would see in our population. I know we said, you know, 12% or 13%, but the BRFSS is for adults only. So this makes sense. It's slightly lower because our cases includes people under 18. We also have seen um, about half of those who've had end-stage renal disease also had a diagnosis of diabetes um, on the death certificate or the notes. So to summarize this, and again, we've seen this, this is kind of a repeat, but it's nice to repeat with a larger group. Linear uh, increase in the estimated prevalence of diabetes in Guam's population for the past 10 years. A definitive linear increase in diabetes as a proportion of all deaths in the past 60 years. Definitely seeing diabetes as a key risk factor for diabetes, a COVID-related mortality. And as somebody already noted, this is a, a well-documented problem in the Pacific. This is not a new one. And this is an important thing we need to address. Again, we noticed this in the fall. We've been kind of updating the coalition almost every month for the past several months with uh, updated data, and we're seeing that consistent pattern with the deaths. 
So I still think we need updated data. I think we need uh, to look at the BRFSS in more detail for the historical data. I know the coalition has suggested that a diabetes registry should be established, but it might not be that that's feasible, but it is feasible if the clinics want to do their own kind of diabetes registry for the patients they have, especially the big clinics. And that could be uh, another form of information for diabetes management and health education. And of course, we all know these are consistent prevention messages, health education, how to manage your diabetes, how to, you know, how to reverse it. Nine out of 10 times type two diabetes is reversible. If you lose, you know, lose weight and change your diet. And of course, changing the Guam physical environment to make exercise more accessible. Wow, that's a great one. Uh, we're such a big car culture, right? We have to drive everywhere. It's, it's dangerous, you know, unless you have walking paths and that sort of thing. So that's pretty much it, folks, unless you have questions. Can I just make a comment, Dr. Ann? Sure. Um, you know, my comment is, I know this pandemic is such a terrible um, situation with us, causing us a lot of deaths. Um, but I, one of the good things that has come out of this is that people are cooking more at home and they're gardening more and they're 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 uh they're planting their own uh bananas green beans and they're sharing yeah. with others bicycles are out of stock in inventory at the sports stores and i see more people out there walking uh with their kids with their kids and it's just uh, an amazing kind of change i think and uh a lot of people biking, you're right. I think we need to start making more bike uh, paths in, uh, for safety. But these are the kinds of things that is a consequence of staying at home. And yeah. uh, I think we just need to, as a, as a uh, diabetes coalition, how do we sustain that? And how do we make that even uh, much more expand, right? And increase in terms of physical lifestyle change and also nutritional, nutritional uh, food. So I just wanted to make that as a comment uh, that's very well, I think, observed. And we just need to make sure we find ways to continue that on. Thumbs up. Thank you, Dr. Ann, so much for this informative presentation. I, I, as you said, this is not new data. It's something that's been released often. However, when you put it all together at one, it, it becomes, um, once again, quote unquote, alarming. And then we're able to see the impact, exactly how it's affected our community. And, you know, there's just no disputing the evidence and the data that has, is presented is evidence. So, um, it just reminds our community of where we're at and what we must all do to create a healthier island community for the generations that are coming. And as the governor said, you know, the uh, pandemic has, has allowed us to grow our own vegetables and fruits and everything. And it actually has been, uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of family members that have done that. It, it's become a family affair. And, you know, it's become um, not a chore, but an activity. Uh, enjoyable activity that families have come together to do. So um, thank you for the reminder of lifestyle changes and everything. Now I would like to call on Dr. Cabrera. Dr. Cabrera is the uh, Department of Public Health and Social Services Chief Medical Advisor and have him share some thoughts uh, on the impact of diabetes in our community. Welcome, Dr. Cabrera. Thank you so much, Kathy, and half a day, everyone. Um, so um, I'll just start out by uh, addressing what uh, Dr. Kubitsky, um asked me to clarify a little bit more between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And we no longer call it juvenile diabetes for type 1 because I'll give you a very uh, specific example. I myself, about three years ago, uh, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Here's my insulin pen. And that was the... It's, it was a uh, a diagnosis that really struck me, and I, I I remember just 
being in complete disbelief um, that that all of a sudden as a uh, that now being uh, you know that I uh, have this diagnosis. And I remember uh, Mila Young's on this call, of course, and I remember going to her and she's uh, amongst her many jobs, she is a patient educator as well. And, and I asked her, um, teach me uh, about diabetes, educate me like, like I know nothing, because I wanted to start from scratch. Um, and I didn't want to bring in uh, all my, my clinical experience necessarily in, in trying to uh, address diabetes myself. So I think that that has made me uh, more effective in how I counsel my patients and how um, I discuss diabetes with them. And so the one question I, I, I ask uh, to a lot of them is, um, what actually kills you? Uh, what, how does diabetes actually kill you uh, for those who have uncontrolled diabetes? And a lot of times they, they don't have the answer, but the answer is a cardiovascular event, heart attack, stroke. It's the same thing for the, gen for the general population as being the number one killer. It's just that it does it to you much younger and, and much quicker. It speeds up that process, uh, so to speak. But if you have it completely under control, you can live a full lifespan. And so that's the, the main part that I, I make in saying that this is a, a marathon and this is something that you're gonna have to uh, you, you know, really put a lot of attention for, uh, for the rest of your life, pretty much. And so what we've learned is that diabetes can speed up um, you know, the process in terms of a cardiovascular event. And we know exactly what COVID has done. It's, it's sped up the process as well for uh, people with, with, with many comorbidities, including diabetes, and, and has cut their lives short uh, by in, in many of them by decades. And so in understanding that, I just wanted to um, close by um, you know, the, the title of this was, you know, wake up call, you know, in capital letters, right? And it reminded me right away of this passage in a book by uh, Yuval uh, Noah Harari, the, uh, his book Homo Deus, uh, which was the follow up to his book Sapiens. And where he, he quoted this, he said, in 2012, 56 million people have died during that year, just in the, uh, in the world. 620,000 of them were from human violence. 1.5 million were from complications of diabetes. And then this is the powerful sentence. He said, quote, sugar is now more dangerous than gunpowder, unquote. And if that's not a wake up call, you know, I don't know what is. And when we think about um, how, uh, how much sugar uh, overalls and not just understanding sugar as we know it, but things that we eat that turn into sugar uh, once your body digests it. And so it's that education that's important and we have to ensure that we continue with the same message. And I, I thank everyone for, um, for sharing uh, today and, and, and Dr. Pupitsky, especially for the data. Uh, it's very informative and you know, we'll, we'll do better because we have to. And the, the last thing I just wanna say is that preparing for the next pandemic, whenever it is, even if it's a decade from now, it starts right now and it starts by reducing our comorbidities and it starts with, with efforts like this from the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cabrera. Talk about a rude awakening that uh, something as simple as a statement that, you know, sugar is more dangerous than gunpowder. Um, and, and a simple statement like that can resonate across, you know, our people. But thank you for those remarks. I'd like to introduce Mr. Patrick Lucis. Patrick is from the Department of Public Health and Social Services. He's the program coordinator for, for the Guam Diabetes Prevention and Control Program. He's also a member of the uh, uh, coalition and he serves as the coalition's liaison to the Department of Public Health. Thank you, Kat. Uh, before I do my acknowledgement, I did want to uh, chime in on what uh, my, Madam Governor said. Um, my wife, <clears throat> during this pandemic, actually started our uh, home garden in the back of the house. She grew uh, lemongrass and she grew uh, eggplant and peppers. And uh, one day she uh, surprised me by making a uh, tenac from, from the backyard. She had uh, uh, cut green beans, she had tomatoes and uh, all the ingredients for, for making tenac So yeah, really, really uh, under, uh, can relate to that girl. So uh, I just wanted to give uh, an undunklu and uh, a gradesh uh, to all uh, who are here today. Honorable uh, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, thank you for gracing us uh, with your uh, your words and your uh, presence. 
also Honorable uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Josh DeNorio. Uh, also, although she was not here, we do want to recognize also Honorable Speaker uh, uh, Therese Tarlahi for uh, giving us her message. Uh, also want to give a big thanks to uh, my boss and our director, uh, Art St. Augustine, who's always been supportive of our uh, Guam Diabetes Control Division and the work we do for diabetes. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Ann, uh, thank you for uh, giving your uh, presentation and always uh, uh, keeping the coalition up to date on uh, data, especially with uh, diabetes and uh, uh, COVID. Uh, Dr. Felix, uh, thank you for uh, giving us also your uh, uh, analysis with the data that we have for uh, diabetes and COVID. And we also want to thank um, the Guam, the Diabetes Control Coalition for your dedication and commitment, uh, especially through the peak of this uh, COVID um, while we were all on lockdown. Um, you never uh, fail to uh, knock on our doors and keep pushing to get the Diabetes Coalition to do the, the work that we have to do. We also want to recognize our uh, partners uh, out there, the Guam Diabetes Association, uh, Mountain Pacific Quality Health. Uh, we want to thank you uh, who are uh, present here in this presentation. And also we want to recognize our uh, media partners. Um, you have uh, played a, uh, you play a very important role in getting the message out there to our community uh, in the uh, building a healthier uh, item for Guam. So we want to thank you everyone for uh, joining in this uh, event today. Thank you, Pat. Now I'd like to introduce Ms. Agnes White Aggie to many of us, fondly known as Aggie, who is our current vice chairperson for the Guam Diabetes Control Coalition. Aggie has a little surprise for everyone. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for, um, for everybody that showed up. It's, it's a great to get everyone's support, especially from our, um, from our government and from uh, our, our Lieutenant Governor and, and Governor as well, that the resources we needed to help combat um, diabetes is there for our asking. So we'll be sure to cash in on that especially as we try to move forward in our coalition to uh, obtain some of our goals, which would be better data collection or uh, as well as um, more uh, outreach programs for our community. Now, uh, the Diabetes Alert Day was established by the American Diabetes Association in 1986. And as Dr. Felix mentioned, it's a wake up call. Dr. Pabuski presented data showing increase in diabetes. We don't have to go far to see um, the, uh, how diabetes has affected our island. Um, so we encourage you, those who are interested in doing something to, to come and join us at the coalition. Those of you who, who want to, who have a passion to do something about diabetes or just get involved, we ask you to join us. We have been meeting even in spite of this uh, epidemic planning events for our community. We had a big um, um, conference in November with the Guam Diabetes Association in Mountain Pacific. It was the very first virtual conference we had. We are also in the process of arranging, of uh, planning a diabetes talks every month till the end of the year uh, related to diabetes self-management. And the first one will be next month given by a pharmacist. The following month will be given by a, a mental health professional. We have one that will be given by a dietitian. So stay in tune for that. So if you want to get involved with us, we have our meetings every third Wednesday of the month. It's a Zoom. Uh, we'll give you the Zoom link. It's from 1230 to 130 every third Wednesday of the month. So it will be in April. Um, and the way to contact us, you can contact Patrick Lucis, the program coordinator for the Guam Diabetes Prevention and Control Program at 727-0219, 727-0219. Or you can visit our Guam Diabetes Control Coalition Facebook page and you can leave a message there. Now, the thing that, Pat, uh, that Kathy mentioned that uh, I have a surprise for you, well, part of the Diabetes Alert Day, the American Diabetes Association encourages us to um, take diabetes seriously, and they encourage us to take this, it's, it's the diabetes risk test. Uh, we can share it on the screen, okay? So you can get online here, that's uh, if you wanna take it online, but the actual PDF, do you have that, Milai? The, the PDF, the questions they actually ask. 
Well, we, we can go through this. It's a sec out. 60 second test. Do you have that? Give me a couple okay. of seconds. I'm just. Yeah. Well, it's a very short test. It's just seven questions. Uh, and then you rate it and then you take your total score. And if it's greater than five, you're at risk for diabetes. And, um, and then these are some of the things you can do. So it's a great test. Um, but Mila, we can just go ahead and go through the online one. Uh, I just wanna show them the questions and, and um, what is being asked. Um, very short and then anybody can take it. I encourage you to have your office uh, members, uh, your family members, whomever to take this risk test. Uh, it's a very good way to assess your, um, your chance of developing diabetes, which of course you can prevent or you can slow down its progression. So we encourage you to do that. Um, how are you as far as that, Milai? Any, any success? Okay. Well, almost. that's what I want. Excuse me? Here almost. We have it. <laughs> almost. Okay. So as, as, here we go. This is the six, a 60 second test. Um, we can, we can scroll through the test and look at the questions they ask. First of all, they ask you a little bit of data about yourself because you have to answer your, your we know age will increase your, your risk for developing di diabetes. So how old are you? And then the next question, um, it has a, okay, so that's age. Um, the next question usually asks male or female. And unfortunately, Guess what? Guess who has a higher incidence of developing diabetes? Okay, guys, you went out on this one. Uh, and the males do. Okay. Uh, the next question, the third question is, of course, related to um, its incidence in your family. And of course, your risk increases if you do have a relative, a close relative with diabetes. Next question, that's the third one. The fourth question is high blood pressure. A definite, a definite uh, factor contributing to the development of diabetes, uh, being diagnosed with high blood pressure. Next one is um, uh, physically active. And that's something we can do. Many of these questions are things we have control of, being physically active. And yes, we can control our, our high blood pressure too as well. Of course, we cannot control if we're male or female or if we have people in our family that have diabetes, but some of these risk factors are quite modifiable. Okay, the next question, Milai. And of course, our ethnicity, we, we can't control that. But uh, guess what? Pacific Islanders, Asians, we all have a higher incidence of, of developing diabetes. Next question. Okay, so your height and your weight, um, that really matters. That would be uh, have to do with your BMI. And we can control, we can't control our height. I wish I could all five feet of me, but I can't, but I certainly can control my weight. And there you are, they will tally it up for you. You give your email, they will tell you your risk, and then they will point you to resources via the American Diabetes Association on what you can do. So this is a great tool. There's also a PDF um, if people you know don't have access to uh, this a computer and the internet, uh, there is a PDF that can be printed and shared you know, a hard copy. And that's it. Thank you very much for attending our, our little mini meeting here in lieu of our regular meeting. We encourage you to come out for our next meeting. We have a lot of work to do. And many of us have a lot of ideas on how to, how to handle this epidemic on our island. Thank you once again for joining us and, and have a good healthy lunch. Thank you everyone. As we come to the end of our uh, presentation here, um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining us and Dr. Luna Sidhuis Maasi for taking time out of your day uh, to join us and help us alert and give everyone a wake up call regarding the issues of diabetes in our community. So have a great day everyone in this paradise we call home. Uh, be safe, be healthy Guam, and many blessings to all of you. Adios. Thank you, everyone.